pleased to welcome in the head coach of Oklahoma State. Uh, he is Mike Boynton. And uh, even though you've been through a lot over the last few days, Mike, you still look pretty good. You're still smiling. Uh, I know you're, you're always kind of a glass half full type of guy, but it, it has to be tough with everything that you and the program have gone through uh, over the last few days, getting the one-year postseason ban, uh, loss of scholarships. I always say, listen, you can deal with everything else, Mike, but to me, the, one, the, the postseason ban is the one that is the most difficult to deal with. Uh, what's it been like, the whirlwind uh, on Friday in which you guys were hit with this seemingly out of nowhere? Yeah, and it's really critical if you just kind of think about what we've been trying to do for three years since I've been head coach and really fighting with this cloud over our heads the entire time anyway. So just getting to a place where now we kind of feel like we got a little bit of tailwind. You know, we've been fight, feel like we've been fighting with headwind uh, the entire three years and we feel like we got some momentum and, and excitement around our program, some real expectations that we could be coming prominent again on a national level. Um, and they just kind of be slapped with this. Um, and not that it was, we knew we were going through the investigation. So I'm not saying that they just came out of nowhere and slapped this on us, but I never imagined when I woke up on Friday morning that, that the penalties that they handed out would be what they were because the facts of the case just don't support that level of uh, a penalty. Uh, if you strip down the case in and of itself, and we just remove the FBI, just for a second, I know it's a really critical part of this, but just remove the FBI for a second. We have a singular violation of NCAA rules, of which they proved at some point, a student athlete got $300, right? That's it. We didn't recruit a kid. We didn't play an ineligible player. When we found that out, the kid went through a review. He paid the money back. He missed three games. And in any other case where that is what happened, this case will be closed. And what they're trying to obviously hit him with, Mike, is the fact that Lamont Evans um, did take somewhere in the vicinity of $20,000 sure. to steer players um, to financial guys, right? Sure. Which, which has been proven. Sure. Which has also been proven that you guys had no knowledge of this. Sure. So and that's where it's, concer it's concerning is – we just kind of got lumped into the, the group of the federal indictment cases, right? And instead of just looking at our case for what it was as it related to the NCAA, they just said, well, this is a part of this. And so it has to be dealt with the same. And that's just not fair, partly because in their own report, the NCAA states, there was no competitive advantage. There was no other person or people either involved or with knowledge of this, right? There were no ineligible players played. Um, and so what Oklahoma State could do in that case is when you find out something's bad happening, you deal with it. And we did. Within three days, Lamont lost his job. And, and what else do you do if you're Oklahoma State at that point? You know? So three years later, now, mind you, Lamont Evans had to deal with the, the facts of what he went through, right? He actually served some time in prison. So he paid a price. It's not like anyone got away with anything, right? And, and now, three years later, a bunch of kids who are like high school freshmen and sophomores are going to have to deal with the consequences of that. And it just seems like a bridge too far. Sure, the university needs to accept the responsibility of hiring him and having him on the staff. But all you can do with a bad employee is fire him. We don't have any more recourse. You can't do anything else. I mean, what else could you do if you don't know? And they acknowledged that no one else knew and was involved. So you know, I just feel like it was a, a bridge too far. Like I said, you know, some of the other cases, which I'm sure will be dealt with in, in that time, uh, seem like they have many more layers to it. This one was pretty cut and dry. We had one person involved. It was three years ago. He dealt with his. We dealt with what we were supposed to deal with and move on. But for a sophomore on my team to now have to face a penalty because of something that happened when he was a sophomore in high school just doesn't seem right and, and certainly is, is pretty unjust. So what, what do you think the NCAA should have done? I know you were asked this question the other day, and the only thing I can come up with, Mike, is a stiff financial penalty 
to any school that is, that is uh, caught breaking the rules or, or somebody in their, you know, on their staff uh, is caught breaking the rules. Uh, make it so stiff uh, that, that people are scared. Because you do have to, listen, you, you know this, you've been around long enough. The penalties do have to be uh, stiff for people. Nobody was scared of the NCAA years ago. Nobody was scared. We, we know that, right? I mean, the enforcement group, whatever, everybody felt like they could do whatever they want. So I think so much now is, is predicated on, hey, listen, we're, we're not going to uh, go down like that anymore. And I think as much as anything, this might have been done based on perception. And, and sure. people oh. saying that the NCAA is soft and they can't be soft on this, on everything regarding the federal investigation, they got to hit hard. And that's what they did here. Yeah, I, I agree, but I think that's also not the right way to do business, right? You still have to, at your core, you have to do the right thing. You can't just decide arbitrarily that we're going to overpunish in a situation where it just doesn't apply, right? And, and so I, I don't know what the answer is, maybe a, a financial hit, because then you affect the, the, the pockets of the university, but you don't impact the kids. That's right. Yep. And the kids like Isaac Likely, who's going to be a junior on our team next year, um, who in 2016 was just trying to figure out what time his, his high school lunch period was. I mean, what are we talking about? Um, and, and so, you know, I think in some ways their efforts to to, to go above kind of their really their normal standard procedure almost makes it even worse, in my opinion, to, well, we didn't really have any power to stop this from happening. And so because someone else has unearthed this stuff, we're gonna take this opportunity to go further than we've ever gone when there's been many cases that have had much more uh, egregious actions that have not been treated this way. And again, I, I think what they, should have done is just look at the case and the things that they are charged with overseeing, right? The federal crime, they can't go around and penalize people for committing crimes. If they start doing that, then no one's gonna have a program. Yeah. Because, I mean, they're really good people, but there are bad people in our business who do sure. bad things. Yep. There's, you know, gamble or... Well, that's up to the school. That, that sure. to me that's is up the to the university school. deal. Yeah. And, and so the NCAA comes in and they go way beyond the pale of what they've ever done. Uh, just is a right to, to the kids more so than anything. So you guys got hit first, even though you probably weren't the first ones to, to receive the, the, the notice of allegation, everything, but you didn't appeal, right? That, that's why you got hit before everybody else, right? Because you decided not to appeal uh, it went to the Committee of Infractions instead of this new independent process. Um, is there, do you have any regrets on not appealing, not trying to go through, and I'm not sure if that was a, a choice you guys would have had any way to go through the independent process, but I felt like, Mike, what the hell is going on here? Everybody involved with the federal investigation all should be going through the same process. Why are you going through the Committee of Infractions and most of the other ones are going to end up going through the independent process. It makes no, it's not logical to me. Well, there are a couple of schools who were implicated in this that haven't even received a notice of allegations yet. Right. That's right. Somehow. Yep. I mean, talk about process. What, I mean, how is this stuff happening? And, and so it just kind of makes you wonder, like, what is the, what's the end goal here? And how, um, what we did was we just thought, when we looked at the information they presented to us, there really wasn't anything to fight. Right. Right. You admitted, thing, right. You admitted to what happened. Because what, what they say in their report that we're supposed to be responsible for is what was played out in federal court. Sure. But it really wasn't anything because there was no, um, overt scheme involving multiple people in our program there wasn't a bunch of guys who were recruited here and received money we didn't play a bunch of guys who weren't eligible you know in defiance of so we cooperated with the process and we gave the information in fact i flew to to uh to georgia in february during the season this year 
to be present at the hearing. I mean, missed the practice, almost missed the game, trying to get back to be cooperative with them. And the way they have treated us and almost kind of in a smug way stated that they went light. I mean, that was probably the most surprising thing to hear in their press conferences. This could have been worse. And I'm thinking to myself, how much worse? I mean, what do we, how? I can't think of anything worse. And then you add on the timing of it all, right? So there are 13 guys who I've committed scholarships to right now, none of which are on my campus because of the global pandemic. <laughs> all the returners were asked to leave. None of my incoming guys have gotten here yet. And so, and then they add the part where any player on my roster can leave without any penalty. Right, right. right. How, so, how are you smiling right now? That's what I want to know. I could have 13 guys, Jeff, I could have 13 guys call me today and say, coach, with all the noise, I just don't want to be a part of it. I could have a kid call me today and say, you know what, I think I should just go to another school in your league. I can't fight it, can't do anything. And then on top of that, we're also in a recruiting debt period. So I don't even have the ability, if that happened, to go out and try to build a team. Right, right, right. right. It's almost like, I wonder if that was a, part of their thought process is let's make this as crippling as possible so that, and again, we've got the lowest amount of bad stuff in our program of all these kids in the water. <laughs> so I'm just curious as to what they were thinking when they decided, because they haven't given themselves a whole lot of upside either. What do you in, mean? In terms, of, in terms of penalty, there's only, so, so they fell on this, there's a matrix that they've got to look at to decide what the penalties, where the penalties go. Well, we got one year. The maximum is four. Right. Max, the most you can get. Now, I'm not saying that that's not more harsh than one. Sure. But I think that what we have in our case is going to look a lot different than what you see play out in some of the other cases. And so. So you don't, Mike, Mike, you really, I, I've had this. Somebody asked me this. Somebody said, hey, listen, just watch here. Nobody else is going to get a postseason ban. I said, listen, I'll bet you 10 dinners on that. Somebody's got it. If you got a postseason ban, and I have said this to people, and I'll say it publicly, if you're the only one who gets a postseason ban, how much do we have to look at race as a part of it? Honestly, Mike, I mean, I don't think that's going to happen. I really believe all the other schools or most of them are going to get postseason bans out of this. But uh, And we're speculating obviously oh. it, if that happens, but man, if that happens, Ooh boy. I mean, that, that would be, that would be ridiculous beyond ridiculous. Yeah. I, I've thought about it all, Jeff. Um, I'll be honest when this first happened in September, 2017, and there were only four people arrested um, and they were all African-Americans. Um, it, it obviously makes you question like, how did this happen? And, and then you watch this F HBO special, and even more concerning, and I'm sure some of it was embellished for TV, all right? I'll, I'll grant you that. But the federal government created this thing. I mean, th this wasn't something that was actually happening until they started it. That's right. That's right. <laughs> and, 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 and guys went to jail. Like, that's the craziest part of this month. Guys them, went to like, jail. Yeah, this doesn't work this way. If you want to do this, if you want to operate in this space, this isn't how you do it. Um, and so, yeah, some of it is, you know, I was the only black head coach of a school implicated and we were up first and we get the hammer thrown at us. So, so certainly, especially with the sensitivity of everything else going on in the country um, right now, it, it's crossed my mind. I, I would hope to think that there are good people who work there. I know they're really smart people who've worked really hard. I would hope that they would be able to look past that. But when I see that they've gone outside of the scope of the actual case that they're charged with overseeing, it certainly makes you wonder, like, what, what, what is the motivation? So I, I know this isn't – I mean, it is at the forefront of your mind, but, but obviously you, you got Isaac Likely, who can go anywhere right now and play oh. anywhere. Uh, you got Cade, the number one player in the country, in my opinion, uh, who's set to come in. And you've got a team that's that's got a chance to break through, like you said. So, how many of the sharks are already circling right now on Isaac Likely, on Cade? Uh, I assume you've been in touch with these guys and the people close to them. How, how 
how do you feel about this in your industry that something like this happens and coaches are going to come immediately? And how many have called you and said, hey, Mike, here's the deal. I want to be up front with you. Uh, Isaac Likely, you know, I'm going to call him. I'm going to call his people. How many of those calls have you gotten? I've gotten no calls from another college coach about our players. Now, I've gotten calls from other coaches, maybe expressing empathy and, you know, calling BS on, on what they believe the decision was. Um, but, but I'm sure some of those guys also have assistants who may be kind of circling wagons around. Uh, I'm very, very aware of the way things operate in our business. And, and, and um, you know, the dis disappointing thing is it, it really shows kind of what I think the NCAA, we talk about this is about the kids all the time. Well, this is actually the worst time for this to happen for these kids. Sure. And then it's even worse for it to be complicated even more by people playing on their emotions in the time of already high stress, right? Uh, but yeah, Isaac likely has been reached out to probably by 20 schools already. Um, you know, Cade's already dealt with the G League on the front end and, and obviously he, he felt good about coming here. And I've had conversations with every, everybody on my team and all their families. Um, you know, we haven't had anybody jump off the ship at this point as I sit here Monday, not saying that that won't happen. Uh, and at the end of the day, I'm gonna do what's best for them. I'm gonna support them in, in whatever decision they decide to make. Um, you know, the unfortunate part is what we've done in building relationships with these guys has been so authentic that I think they all feel like they wanna rally together and do this. Sure. Um, but we'll see, uh, it'll take some time. Uh, but yeah, they've all been contacted. And they've all have had people reach out to them and say, hey, you know, you don't have to deal with that over there. You know, come over here and, and uh, have the same opportunity and, and play on a good team. And um, so it's concerning, but it's not surprising. What what conversations have you had with Cade and, and, and Cannon right now uh, over the last day or two and, and kind of where where's their head at right now? Yeah. So on Friday, when I got the information uh, from our administration that the news would be coming out, um, I immediately left that meeting and started calling the guys. Um, and, and so not necessarily in a pecking order, but in terms of the impact on their careers that this could have. Cade would probably be first because the expectation is he's only going to be in college for one year. And he's really competitive and he wants an opportunity to play an NCAA tournament. And so if that's not going to happen, I need to tell him honestly where we are. Uh, he was great. The next person I called was Farron Flavors. Uh, the kid I just signed as a grad transfer. So he's in a very similar boat in that he's got one more year of an opportunity to play college basketball. And, and uh, he was good. Uh, then what I went down. Them, like, what do you, what do you, what do you tell him? Is it a recruiting pitch to stay or is it no, more? No. Here's what it's happened. This is about recruiting for me, Jeff, at this point, this is about the kids because I really believe that. And I feel like, unfortunately, that's not where we are in our game in many ways. I think this decision is, is another example of that. This isn't about the kids. This is about power, and they want to show their power and influence over uh, whatever they have a jurisdiction over, and it's really unfortunate that they didn't look beyond that and say, what is right? Just pure and simple, what is right? This isn't right, and so I've dealt with it uh, from a more compassionate standpoint, and I've told, I told Kate, I said, listen, I know this isn't what you hoped to be the case, and I want you to know I want you here, but this isn't about Oklahoma State right now. This is about what's best for you. And I'm going to help him through this process. Uh, I'll be very intimately involved in the conversations with his family. And, and they all know that I care about him enough to make sure he doesn't put himself in a situation where he's going to be harmed in this process, right? Uh, and so the same conversation is for everybody. It just kind of looks different for guys who are expected to be here beyond this year sure. if we're going to face this penalty now. Uh, the other thing that you got to keep in mind is not to lessen the significance of the penalties is we'll still, even if we if we fail in our appeal attempt, we'll still have an opportunity to play some games uh, and practice together and stuff like that. So, you know, it's, it's just kind of wrapping your head around the unfairness and the unjust nature of what's the impact on the people that have, have had absolutely nothing to do with this thing and are about all the right things. I mean, we just finished this semester with a 374 team GPA. I mean, you kidding me? I got a bunch of good kids who want to work hard, who are about the right things. And to almost have what they've already been punished through, just living through this for three years, 
doubled down on and saying, we're going to punish you more, uh, just, just really misses the mark totally. Yeah, you finally gotten this thing to, to where you wanted it, right? I mean, you, you've yeah. had some issues with the program, whether it's uh, – I feel like I've been guys. trying to fly a plane in a 150-mile-an-hour headwind yeah. for three years. <laughs> You're finally – And I haven't it. gotten very far flying that plane in that 150-mile-an-hour headwind. I got from, like, Stillwater. I may be somewhere like Albuquerque, New Mexico now. <laughs> and I feel like I finally got some wind at my back. And we, we got the tail went out of the way, and then somebody turned the plane around and put me back in the headwinds. <laughs> so, do you think with it, with the appeal, have you guys looked back? I assume you know Chuck Smurd, who you've worked with, and uh, some other people with this, uh, with the whole process. Ha has it happened before, Mike, where uh, schools have gotten hit with postseason bans and then it's been reversed, or no? I can't speak with a whole lot of knowledge about specific penalties that have been reduced but there have been some where they've acknowledged yeah maybe this is this isn't necessary uh and so we're working through that we're looking at all the cases that have come before us that maybe have similar circumstances uh and just seeing where they fall and what are the factors that may be similar and again the, the only thing that really makes ours different is the fbi was involved on the front end and i don't know if it's embarrassment uh, from the NCA standpoint that they felt like, you know, we're not going to let people think that the FBI is the one that has to police our business. But the I think it's the perception, is, Mike, yeah. I think it's the perception that they need to look tough. Sure. Everybody's watching. And over the years, uh, and listen, the part of the problem with the NCAA always has been, like you said earlier, uh, it's arbitrary. Right, they're the judge, they're the jury. They can do whatever the hell they want, which is why, to me, in in these cases, I just feel like finally they did something right with this independent uh, review board. Mm -hmm. So why not utilize that for even? I get it. You guys didn't fight it. You didn't appeal, but that shouldn't matter to me. All these cases, when, when you're gonna look at something that might uh, incur a postseason ban. Why wouldn't you let independent people that don't have something to be gained Absolutely. Uh, by being involved within the NCAA, let those people adjudicate it? Sure, sure. I mean, again, it, it's a pretty new deal. Right. Uh, right. So no one really knows how it'll look and it's, you know, as it plays out. Uh, but the truth is, if you would just think about this thing, what's the right thing here? And get, get rid of the emotion of how you felt on September 26, 2017. Right. you got to let that go and think about they can't here's what really happened. Yeah, they, they, can't, they can't do that. And, and I still say, listen, and maybe I'm wrong here, but I feel like – and I don't know how much you care. You care, but you don't. You care more about what, what's happened to you guys. But I'm looking at it and I'm saying, all right, if you guys got this, well, that means USC, Arizona, and Auburn have to get at least this. They've got to get the same. You know, all four of you were in a similar situation, right, where somebody took bribes to steer players to certain financial guys. So I feel like it's the same with all four of you. And then the other, the other schools are all a little bit different. But I feel like if, if somebody else, Mike, doesn't get that postseason ban, one of those three other schools, how can that be? It can't. It can't. It'd be, it'd be hard to understand. Um, but without real, I don't know their cases, right? So, so obviously, um, the NCA's investigation was different than the FBI. They're finding NCA rule violations, and that's where I keep coming down on. Like, this isn't about the federal government. The guys who have authority over federal crimes did their jobs. I don't agree with how they got there, but they did their jobs. Those guys either pled guilty or faced the punishment for those crimes. Book Richardson's a dear, dear friend of mine. Yeah, you're both went New York. Went to jail, right? And so he paid his debt. If he didn't commit an actual NCAA crime outside of that, then I don't know how they hold them accountable to just what, again, it'd be like if a guy went and robbed a bank. You can't get, you can't suspend a team from playing because a person at the school went and robbed the bank. The school has to fire him, and then the government or the police and and that whole deal have to deal with whatever the criminal activity was. Mike, if I give you the option right now and I said to you, all right, one year postseason ban 
or, or you take a one year suspension? What would you do? Uh, personally, yeah. So if my team could stay together and they would be, I'd take the suspension every day of the week. Yeah. I think I knew you'd say that. And, and I actually thought that's what would happen in a lot of these cases. Not to say you had any involvement. You didn't. Sure. But, but again, with this new kind of coaches control thing, right? I felt like a lot of the coaches in this are going to get hit with suspensions. Maybe I'm wrong. I mean, it looks like I'm wrong, certainly by, by the way this first one played out. But I thought maybe you get hit with a 10, 12-game suspension because it, it, it incurred partially under your watch, right? Yeah, I guess. You know, so this, this whole deal started in 2015 right. is what, what a I different one for you. I think. Um, yeah, I right. only yeah. When, when the, when the, um, when the news broke, yeah. I'd been a head coach for about five and a half months. Right. right. So <laughs> yours is different. Yours is totally different. Oh, and that's what I failed to just come to grips with. Like they can see this and they actually wrote it in, you know, I was very cooperative, you know, other than the coaches in Merle code, there wasn't a single name in that indictment on the initial part that I even was aware of. I didn't even know anyone else in the deal. You know, I just didn't run in those circles. And I'm not judging those guys. But to get to hear what the NCAA is really what my, my concern is, is I just think it's a bridge way too far. And it really doubly punishes guys who've already been punished. These kids have already been punished for having to just live through this. Um, and it's at some point, you just got to look yourself in the mirror and have a conscience and say, this isn't right. I wouldn't want my child to have to deal with this type of treatment when they did things the right way. So I don't want to keep you too long because I'm sure you have calls to make to, to ward off some of the uh, people that are coming after your kids. But what, what is it like now? I mean, we're, we're Monday here. Uh, I, I assume over the weekend you've been making calls, but what, what can you really do now, Mike, other than stay in contact with, with the players, with their families, with the people around them? I mean, there's not much you can do, is there? No, I mean, usually today would be probably, today would be the start of summer school for our guys in a normal year. So I would have all 13 of those guys on my campus and we would be able to have conversations face to face. And obviously there still would be some, some, uh, some confusion and maybe some people poaching at them, but at least I would be able to see them and be around them and help them through this. But considering where we are now, that's not even an option available. And so what I can do is just call them and text them and tell them, hey, if you got concerns or questions, call me, call the staff. You know, we're here to support you. Um, yeah, I really believe in the character of the kids we have, though. I believe that they, they're they here because they understand that things don't always go your way. You got to be a fighter. You got to fight through adversity. Um, but sometimes you just want to have a fair shot. And right now I don't feel like my kids are getting a fair shot at this deal. So I'm expressing that to them. And uh, tell them at, at the end of the day, whatever they decide, each individual person, I'm going to be here to support them. When are they allowed to come on campus now? What's what's the latest with that for you guys? Yes, so the Big 12 rule is that we can start voluntary activities on July 6th. So you've still got a while. So we got another month, give or take. Uh, and then we got to go through the, the testing and, and the quarantine and, and where you've been and who you've been around and physicals, which will probably look a little bit different this year than they have in the past. Uh, so there's just a lot going on right now. Do you, yeah. do you have any eligibility left, Mike, in case, in case you lose some guys? You look like you could still, you know, go out there. I don't have any eligibility left. And I'll tell you, if I did, I better get my butt in the gym and start working again. <laughs> no, you, I don't know if I have any skill left. Yeah, exactly. Well, you're, you, you're, uh, you, may, you may need some bodies there. You may, you may need to do an open workout. Hey, I may, open yeah. Trial. Honestly, yeah. I mean, no, seriously, I'm sure you thought about this. It, it could happen. I mean, seriously, Jeff. I mean, every player on my team could call me today, one through thirteen, and say, "Coach, I've talked to my family over the weekend, and we just think it's best for us to move on." And what do you say, could, what, what do you say there? Thought. Yeah, what do you? I mean, so I, I haven't given that much thought because I don't think that's a realistic possibility, right? I think there's a chance that maybe a couple guys could think maybe this isn't the best place for me this year. Um, but I think we'll be able to, for the most part, stick together um, and, and go fight this battle, you know, as a group. You know, like I said, these kids are, they're different. You know, I, I don't, you know, Kay's really the first high profile guy we've recruited around here. Isaac Lightley was signed at Fresno State coming out of high school now. Right. 
People oh. don't realize that. <laughs> we got a bunch of underdogs. Your name was recruited, literally visited us in Southern Illinois and led the Big 12 in block shots as a freshman. I mean, so we got a bunch of kind of under the radar guys who just worked hard and just really want an opportunity to go out and compete. And, and right now it feels like they've been stripping up that uh, to no fault of their own. What, what needs to change through this process? What, what needs to change if, if you're looking at it again? Uh, is it something where the NCAA, if they do hit uh, a program with a postseason ban, um, you wait a year? to give the kids at least a chance to make a, a, an informed decision and they're not uh, scrambling like your players are right now? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of things that could be reconsidered. Uh, I think the fact of just the, the postseason ban in and of itself almost always punishes people who were not involved in this process. Um, and the, the significance of that and I understand if something egregious happens, you need to meet it with something that's pretty penal. But at the end of the day, you still got to find a way to punish the people who were actually involved. The problem is, for us in particular, we don't have anyone here that would fit. The person who was involved faced the, the, the consequences of his actions. So you don't come back and say, we acknowledge that you did, really did everything that you're supposed to do. And we acknowledge that you were very cooperative through this process. You never played an ineligible player. You didn't recruit anybody through this means. Um, but anyway, but we're gonna we're gonna do this anyway because we need to send a message. This isn't about sending messages. At the end of the day, take all that away. Just do the right thing. You go around touting that you're about kids. This decision isn't about kids. Period. It's about people wanting to show power, and that's really unfortunate. Well, listen, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you go because uh, you got to be looking at your phone, unfortunately, today. <laughs> I, I feel for you, man. I feel wow. for you because – uh, you know, I tweeted out yesterday, man. I, um, because of where I grew up, I was hardened. Um, and I got an opportunity to see how, you know, you just fight for what you believe in. And, and, and no one really can ultimately determine the success you have except for you. And so that's my thought process. No matter what happens when we go through this appeal, I'm going to hold my head hell high because I know how I've operated. I know the work ethic that I have. And ultimately, this program and, and me personally, we're, we're going to find success. And when we do, it'll be that much more, uh, that much sweeter to, to find it. So I'd be remiss if I didn't at least uh, ask you everything that's going on in our country as a, as a, a black head coach. And actually, I have the numbers here. How about this? I'm going to read them to you. I did this uh, yesterday. Uh, there are 100 blackhead coaches right now um, in the country. I'm going to, I'm going to, there are 100 of 357. That's 28%. There are 80 of 336, if you're not including the uh, HBCUs, yep. 24%. Take a guess. How many Power Five black head coaches there are right now? So, uh, so Power Five, you just ACC, SEC, Big Twelve, Big Ten, Pac Twelve. You got it. And I know there are none currently in the Pac Twelve, and That's I know correct. that there are only two in the Big Twelve. Correct. So, I mean, unless those other leagues are majority black head coaches, we, we're not going to get very far in this count. <laughs> you got eight. One yeah. in the Big Ten, Juwan Howard. You and yeah. Shaka in the Big Twelve. Uh, ACC, Leonard Hamilton, Kevin Keats, Jeff Capel. As you said, none in the Pac-12, two in the SEC, Conzo Martin and Jerry Stackhouse. Yeah. Eight. Eight. And uh, so before, before um, Juwan Howard got hired last year, the Big 12 had zero. Big 10. Big 10. I mean, Big 10, excuse me. The Big That's 10 right. had zero. That's right. I, I guess – and my, my point wasn't necessarily to highlight that, but, but just to show uh, how important, the minority though, right? – yeah, I mean, that, that, that's for another day. I was going to hit you with more of kind of what's going on in the world here. And as a black man, as a black head coach, um, kind of what your thoughts are watching all the protests, if this has uh, at all made you feel kind of uh, more positive that there's going to be change and sustained change, Mike, or is this something that 
we're seeing for now and you're afraid is going to disappear in two months? Yeah, I'll go back to your point about the college coaches because I think the specific about college coaches is a discussion for another day. But I think in this big scheme, it is a small part, a microcosm of what is a problematic, right? There are not enough, there's not enough diversity in positions of influence and positions of authority and true decision-making positions across the board. College coaching is just one example, right? For, for me, I'm a naturally optimistic person. I believe in the, the good of people in general. This, these last two weeks feels different to me. I told my staff and my players this last week because it's almost been unanimous. The, the, um, there's been a few who may have tried to dig at it, but for the most part, everyone's accepted that what they watched in that video with George Floyd was grossly unacceptable, an embarrassment to our country. That's that right. people around the world saw a person have his life literally taken away by another person on the streets in view of public people, right? So it's hard to defend that one. And because of that, there's an opportunity for everybody to say, we don't want that to be what people think is possible. We want people to come here because it's the home of the brave and the land of the free. And not because if you don't look like somebody or you're not as educated or because you don't have as much money that you're gonna be considered a second class citizen. And so I think that we have to be active in making sure that this doesn't die down, right? I don't know if the protests can last forever, but I think the protests need to lead to the next steps. What are the actions that need to be taken? What are the policy changes that need to be made? How do we get more people in the room who have diversified uh, questions? Because again, if I, if even for me, if I just sit around a table of black guys, similar thinking as me, I'm not gonna grow as much as if I'm challenged to think about the way somebody you sees talking. Me. Yeah, you and me talking. Yeah. Absolutely. The way I grew up is totally different than the way our golf coach grew up here at Oklahoma State, yep. than Mike Gundy grew up. So we need to have conversations like, what was it like for you? Here's my perspective. This is what it was like for me. And I think uh, people from different areas, usually good people are comfortable um, having easy conversations, but when it challenges the things that maybe they've always been accustomed to, that's when it gets uncomfortable. Sure. And that's where we have to change our mindset. We have to engage ourselves in uncomfortable conversations. I have to be willing to accept that someone carrying a gun is something that they just know to grow up with. You couldn't carry guns growing up in New York. It just wasn't legal. So. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> Boston. Yes. So when I come to a place and I think people carrying guns, I'm kind of like, whoa, I'm kind of nervous. But it's just kind of a way of life in some places. Yeah. yeah. Growing up in New York, listening to a police siren is like hearing a bird's chirp in some parts of the country. You know, you don't get alarmed when you hear it's just kind of like, uh, is there a fire? Is there a fight? Did somebody get shot? You know? And so if we just open our minds that we can be different and that's okay. Uh, but I think until we get more people, back to the college coaches question in those rooms where they're at least expressing their views and maybe the conversation can be, can grow into, okay, I didn't think about that and I wouldn't think about it on my own, but that makes a lot of sense. So I think there's an opportunity here for us to really, really take a step forward as a country. Um, and I think, I think college basketball can take the lead on this. I think athletics in general can take the lead on this. I'm with you. I'm with you. I think everybody's got to do their part. Everybody's got to do their part. And it, it, it is nice to see uh, a lot of people who look like me sure. uh, standing up and saying, yeah. you know what? Enough is a fuck enough. Yeah. Enough is enough. And we're going to help. We're going to help change. And yeah. yeah, we all need to be educated. No right? question. We all do. And I tell people all the time, it, it's not just a black and white deal. It, right. It's a humanity deal. Like we just have to care about enough each other enough to where if I see a black person treating a white person poorly, I need to be able to challenge that and say, that's not right. right. We can't be friends if that's how you treat people. So yeah. we have to be able to affect our small circles first, the people that we care about, 
So we all have people maybe in our families or that we're friends with that we know sometimes do things that we're like, I don't know if we should be doing that, but do we challenge that person? Do we stand up and say, hey man, I mean, I don't, I, I think, I think you should apologize. There'll be more of that now. There'll be sure. more challenging. Yeah. This that's a good be. thing. You're right. It's a good thing as long, you know, you got to handle it the right way, right? I mean, there's, a, there's, a, there's a way to kind of talk through it. And I think that's the key to, to, to make sure that you're, you're getting through to that person. Absolutely. Right? I mean, you, you know, if you can affect one and, and that person affects one, it, it just keeps snowballing. Yeah. And, and I think and that's... The, you know, part of the issue is right now there's a... Um, there's a misconception that this is purely black and white. And I tell people all the time, there is some black and white to this, right? When I get pulled over by police officers, my heart starts racing yeah. because I don't know how the, I'm talking like, not like I robbed the bank, right? If I robbed the bank and I get caught by the police, I should be worried. <laughs> That's right. But if I'm just speeding and I'm going 15 over the speed limit, how many of us haven't done that? Oh, right? Right. but I get pulled over and I'm like, man, I hope this is just going to be about the speeding. And you may get pulled over and you don't even think about it. I don't think about Mike. I'm not thinking about it. I'm thinking about doing You're probably it. like, man, I wish this dude would just leave me alone today. Yeah, I'm thinking about <laughs> I'm late. I'm late for where right. I got to go. Just, you know what I'm thinking? How long is this dude going to keep me here? Absolutely. That's all I'm thinking right. is like, I only got 10. I'm late for this game or I'm late for whatever. Like, I hope this only takes 10 minutes and then I'm pissed off when it takes 20. But no, I can't relate. I can't sure. relate to that. I've never never even thought about that nah, Jeff, if you and i walked into a nice high-end store and we both wanted to buy our wives a nice shop, uh, purse or something right when you walk into the store you're a shopper yeah yeah and i can walk into the same store i could probably afford the same bag yep. i think i don't know how much they. Pay oh, you, you, you make a little more than i do <laughs> i know what you make but i might be a shopper no but i might not be right <laughs> Right. So that's kind of what the privilege conversation is and people don't want to accept. 100%. It's just that you get the benefit of the doubt. Yeah, which is just, it, it, it's, it's incredible to think about, but, but completely accurate. It's sure. completely accurate. And, and we, need to, we need to look from within and say like, okay, it's real. How do we change that? How do we, how do we start to change? We're not going to, listen, we're not going to change it for, uh, you know, the, the, Maybe even I'm 48, Mike. I'm I'm hoping for my generation it changes. But no Dan, right, I, I want it to change for my daughter's generation. No Absolutely, 16. And I want it to change for my children. And, right. and when they, when you know, when my son is out jogging, I don't want him to yep. be worried, and I don't want I want whoever's jogging in front of him to look at him and say hi and just. That's right. Exactly. That's not trying to stay in shape just like I am. You know. Yep. It's not up to anything. <laughs> well, listen, I, I, I appreciate you uh, you coming on here for a while. It was longer than uh, I would have liked to have kept you. Okay, but, man, it's important uh, stuff. So I, it, I appreciate the opportunity. It's, it's all important stuff. That that's the again the positive is you you're you're so uh, willing and an open book. When a lot of guys right now, especially with the appeal coming still. A lot of guys would come out and, and be very weary of, oh, well, I got to be, I got to be smart about what I say, but it's clear. Like you have nothing to hide. You got nothing to hide. You, no. Like you said, you, you said what happened. Lamont Evans acted unto himself. He was punished with a 10 year show cause. He's never going to coach again in college basketball. We know that. Yeah, um, and so even that, right. That sounds really penal. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to contend today that what we had was way more consequential than what it is for him, for college basketball, right? Yep. He's not going to try to coach college basketball again. No, he's done. He's done. Book Richardson's done. I mean, we're going to try to keep, we're going to still try to keep running our program. And what they've done is essentially tie our arms and our legs together and dared us to run. Well, run, run forest, run. That's all. That's all I can say. Just run my man and, and, and try to, uh, Try to see what you can do here to keep this program together. I know, I know that's kind of been your mantra here is growing up in New York. Uh, you've been through quite a bit. You've seen quite a bit. And uh, th this, this, this would be a, uh, a book. If you, can, if you can get this group together yeah. and, uh, and do what we thought you could do, uh, you got to start with Cade. You, you, better, you better keep Cade. He's important. But, but the other guys are too. Yeah. He, he's an important one. No question about it. Agreed. He's an important one.
All right. Well, listen, good luck with everything. And uh, appreciate, appreciate you coming on and be safe. All right. Thanks for having me. Take care, man.